Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cornerstone Chinese Church for November 29th, 2020. We're almost into December. Hopefully you all had a great Thanksgiving and Turkey Day. I know we did, and we're looking forward this morning's worship and praise. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 105 that reads, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. I know for some of you, you had a great Thanksgiving. Some of you have not had a chance to even sit down and remember and count his blessings. So maybe this Sunday morning is the opportunity for you to count all of his wondrous deeds and works in your lives and to praise him together. Are you ready? Let's praise him. together.
truck tried to hide you and steal you away. Death tried to keep you inside of grave. An enemy fought you and tried but lost. When we cried, we cried for freedom, we tore down the walls. The weight of our burden carried it all. Our fears and our fears. For today's congregational prayer, I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, We are going to watch a praise and praises um, from people who are on the front lines. Uh, And so we praise God that we have a few people that shared last week, and these are the people that didn't get a chance to share their praises and thanksgiving. And so I'm glad we can show it this Sunday. So we'll start with the thanksgivings first. 
and then I'll go to congregational prayer. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my brother. We're thankful for our help and friends and family during this time. Happy Thanksgiving from the Wales family. Hi everyone, happy Thanksgiving. Hope everyone's staying healthy during these times. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lynn and I'm a nurse at Central DuPage Hospital um, in the Pediatric Outpatient Neurology Clinic. It's been pretty challenging working as a nurse during this time, uh, during the pandemic, but I'm so grateful for so many things and God has really blessed me um, uh, during the past half, almost a full year now. Uh, and uh, first of all, I'm just so thankful that I have a job where I can help people and, and also to stay healthy during this time and that God has protected me and my family where we can all still um, be able to work. And uh, second of all, God really challenged me and uh, pulled out me out of my comfort zone because during the high volume of COVID patients, I was pulled out of my unit and having to work inpatient where um, I was needed most with adult patients, which I've never done before in my 29 years of uh, nursing career. So that definitely has taught me so much and, uh, and really appreciate what I do. And um, I just wanna take this time to wish all of you happy Thanksgiving and um, please continue to mask up and um, maintain social distancing. Thank you. Hey Mackenzie, what are you thankful for? Mm -hmm. I'm thankful turkey. Okay, you're thankful turkey. I'm thankful that uh, God continues to provide for our family and that we're all healthy and safe and that the church can continue to be a community and support one, one another during this crazy time and also, I'm thankful that I can experiment with having longer hair at home. Um, I'm thankful for a new pace of life right now, um, that we get to spend more time together at home, um, doing a lot of things together, um, like passing on some uh, recipes that I learned from my grandmother onto Mackenzie. Happy Thanksgiving! Happy Thanksgiving! <laughs> As far as congregational prayer, um, we received the sad news about a week ago that Luis's sister um, passed away in Skokie from COVID-19 symptoms. So remember Luis um, and his family as they mourn the loss of his sister. Uh, let's continue to pray for those who are sick and suffering for those who are going through chemo. Uh, Mr. Tor Olson, uh, let's remember Ken Lee's dad as well with his um, stage four cancer of the liver diagnosis. Let's continue to pray for, for those who are looking for jobs uh, and for those families that are suffering this uh, season. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Father, we wanna thank you once again for all that you have meant to us and all that you are doing and have done for us throughout this year. We know, Lord, that you are in charge, that you are sovereign, that you are good in all your ways. And I pray, Lord, that you would do your good and perfect will in the lives of your people. And Father, this Thanksgiving season, as it comes to a close, help us to not just be thankful for this day and four days, but also for all these days, knowing that you're a God who has been with us and has protected us and has led your people. And so, Lord, we want to give you all the praise. And Father, we pray for Luis in a very special way as they mourn the loss of his sister. We thank you that she was a believer. Thank you, Lord, for watching over her even when she was in the hospital. But we thank you, Lord, that you have called her home. And we thank you for the faith that you had given her and the family so that they know that there's a, a better tomorrow for her. We thank you, Lord, that her suffering was not that long and that she's with you in eternity. 
Father, we also remember those who are suffering for Tor Olson as he goes through chemo for his brain cancer. We remember Ken Lee's dad uh, as he deals with his stage four cancer of the liver. Pray, Father, you would be with each of these men, that you would give them faith, you would give them eyes that will reach out and see your glory in and through what they're going through in their suffering. Show forth your goodness and the way that you want to reveal yourself to them. Father, we also pray that you would give them all the support that they need, the endurance and the perseverance, uh, especially through the medications and the, through the chemo. And Father, I pray that you would give them a support system that can uphold them during this time. We also pray, Lord, for all the people that are suffering these days because of uh, employment issues, because of family issues. Pray, Lord, that you would sustain them, you would watch over them. Give them the hope that comes from knowing you as their Lord and Savior. Help them to see in and through what they're going through that there's a purpose and a plan for this. And I pray, Father, that they would seek your ways. They would seek help through the brothers and sisters you have surrounded them with, such that we can see your hand at work. We thank you, Lord, that none of us is called to be an island, but we are called to be a connected community. So I pray, Father, that we would reach out to people, not the people who can help us, but the people that can hold us accountable and help us in this journey. Father, we also pray for all that's going on uh, next month through the Christmas season as we start Advent. Pray, Father, that we would be able to reach people in and through this Advent season. And the message of hope and love and reconciliation would be a message that we can reach people in and through our ministries. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hopefully you all enjoyed the Thanksgiving combined service that you saw last week. If you haven't, you can go to the church website and see the testimonies and the message that was really special. I think that's one of the things that will stand out to me for the year 2020. Well, this morning I want to start with um, an illustration that's probably familiar to most Christians. A few years ago, there was a movie that came out called The Shack. But... Ten years before that, there was a book that was also um, called The Shack, and so the movie reflects the book. And I read it a long time ago, and I have to say when I read it, it was somewhat awkward. It was a little weird. But then watching the movie, it made sense. So for those of you who want to see the movie, I would recommend read the book first. Well, the book The Shack captures the very essence of a God who wants nothing more than to have a loving relationship with his people. And it's an incredible message in a very powerful and at times gut-wrenching story. Most of you don't know how the book came together. The author, William Paul Young, a Canadian, wrote it based largely on 11 years of his own life struggle. His wife, had been on him for a while to write down his unconventional views about God for their six children so that he could have a memoir that he could pass on for generations. And finally, he did it in the form of a story. He shared it with a friend who shared it with a few other friends. They believed it would make a powerful movie, but thought it should become a book first. 26 Christian publishers turned him down. The Christian ones thought it was too far out there. And the secular publishers thought that he talked about Jesus too much. So finally, he and his friends started their own publishing company. With only $300 worth of publicity, people pre-ordered and kept ordering more copies of the book The Shack. And then finally, it ended up number one on the New York Times fiction list. In interviews, Paul says the book and the movie is clearly a miracle. What was intended for his kids, God got a hold of and drew unaccountable numbers closer to him in relationship. Paul Young saw God show up 
and he was sufficiently humble to give God the glory. That same God wants to show up in your life. Don't be surprised if God shows up in your circumstances, your next conference call or dinner. You never know what part of your life he will invade. Because if we're honest, God doesn't just own part of our lives. He owns it all. My dear friends, God often shows up in our lives and in our meetings, desiring to help us and to bless us richly. But so often, we ignore him, and we miss out on the blessing because we don't recognize who he is. If we could only recognize the presence of God, if only knew we knew of his presence, then we wouldn't miss out on so much that he has to offer. So, if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Genesis chapter 33 where our friend Jacob sees and experiences God. He has been wrestling with God all night, but it was dark, so Jacob couldn't see very clearly. And then the sun rises, and Jacob sees God in the full light of day. What does he see? Well, in verse 1, Jacob looked up, and there was Esau. You see, Jacob sees God in his brother Esau, and you will understand it as we'll go along. So he looked up and saw Esau coming with his 400 men, and he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Jacob is still not sure how his brother Esau is going to respond, in anger or with a warm welcome. And so he lines his family up in order of importance to him, for the least to the most important. He puts his beloved Rachel in the safest place, last, behind everybody else. And Jacob himself bows before his brother seven times. You see, 20 years previously, Jacob stole Esau's right to be the lord and master of the family through trickery and deceit. Now, Jacob believes that his brother Esau is out to get get him. And so this is his way of appeasing the brother's anger. And then verse 4. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Esau was not angry. He was happy to see his brother, and together they wept tears of joy. Verses 5 to 7. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you, he asked. Jacob answered, they are the children of God that is graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau meets all of Jacob's family and welcomes them with open arms. When Jacob sees God, he sees the face of his brother full of forgiveness and love, and that's what we will see when we see God. Dear friends, if you're looking for God, point number one, when God shows up, you can expect his mercy. You can expect his mercy. Notice the countenance of mercy that's here. See the face of pardon. For when God shows up, brothers and sisters, forgive one another, because that is the nature of God himself. That is Jesus dying on a cross for our sins, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is God removing our sin from the east is from the west. Psalm 103 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. 
The face of God is the face of forgiveness. And when he comes into our lives, when he comes into our church, that's exactly what we'll see all over the place. And it's an experience. We'll see brothers and sisters embracing one another because they have forgiven each other. Bill White talks about his friend Greg, who recently put together a mini high school reunion when he went back home to Indiana. 17 years later, they got together for a high school reunion, and they had a riot reveling in their glory days and finding out what was currently going on in each other's lives. As the night was winding down, Greg noticed that his friend Debbie was getting teary-eyed, and he couldn't but help but ask what was going on with her. Through tears, she said, it's sad that there are some things you just can't forget. Certain that something spiritual was going on, Greg pressed Debbie about what she meant. Finally, she told him, in the second grade, 27 years previously, a girl named Karen had started the Debbie Haters Club. Debbie had never forgotten over the pain of that, and she had never forgiven Karen. Knowing that Karen was at the reunion that night, Greg told Debbie she could talk to her. Excuse me, that she should talk to her. Debbie refused, but Greg insisted. In fact, Greg ended up orchestrating the effort towards reconciliation. When Karen was collecting her coat to leave the party, Greg pulled her aside into a separate room and asked her to wait for him to return. Then Greg went to Debbie. When both women were together in the room, Greg stepped out of the room and stood guard outside the door. Greg couldn't hear a word that was going on between the two ladies, but he didn't need to. As they both left, he could see the freedom on their faces, a freedom that only comes with reconciliation. You see, God was there, and Debbie almost missed it because she was reluctant to deal with the hurts from the past. Let me ask you, how about you this morning? Is there somebody that you need to forgive? Or, even harder, is there somebody to whom you need to admit your sin and receive forgiveness from that person? Dear friends, don't miss seeing God's handiwork because you choose to hang on to the bitterness of the past. Let it go. Give it all to God, and with his help, make things right with each other. Take that step of courage and faith. If you're looking for God, look for his mercy. Then second, second point. When God shows up, you experience favor. And that's what we see in verses 8 through 11. Notice the smile of grace. See the countenance of undeserved kindness and love. And that's what Jacob saw here. He saw the face of favor in his brother. Verse 8, Esau asks, what do you mean by all these droves I met? To find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. Jacob is looking for favor from his brother. It's the Old Testament word for grace, which means undeserved kindness and love. Jacob had tried to buy Esau's favor by sending him droves and droves of animals, from camels and goats and donkeys and sheep and so forth. 480 of them, if you remember from chapter 32. And here, verse 9 and 10. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I've found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Three times in these last three verses, some form of the word favor has been used because when Jacob experienced God, he saw the face of favor in his brother. Esau accepted Jacob 
unconditionally, even though Jacob had cheated him out of his birthright and the family blessing. Now, Jacob no longer feels a need to buy Esau's favor. Instead, he wants to give because he already has Esau's favor. Verse 11, please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Jacob said, God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. Esau just had plenty, as we see in verse 9. But Jacob had all. He had the whole thing. He was complete because he had experienced God's full favor, his grace. When Jacob experienced God, he saw the face of favor in his brother. And that's where we will see it too. When God shows up, we will see brothers and sisters in the family accepting one another unconditionally. We will see brothers and sisters extending grace towards one another, even as God extending grace towards each of us. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were good, not after we had earned his love. No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We know this already, but let me exclaim this this way. We cannot buy God's favor. We cannot do God any favors to win over his love. We have God's unconditional favor because of what Christ has done. And through faith, we're able to accept that into our lives. And as a result of that grace, we can live this life with favor towards others. We are made complete. We are made whole because of his grace. Have you experienced that kind of love, unconditional love in your life? You see, that's what grace does in our relationships. It makes us givers rather than takers, and it makes us whole. It heals those relationships that were once broken. When I say the word Richard Foster, most of you have heard that term because he's written many Christian books about the spiritual disciplines. Well, his son Nathan wrote a book in which he talks about a time when he was living what he called a ragged attempt at discipleship. At that time, Nathan was afraid to share his honest thoughts about God and his disillusionment with the church, especially with a father who had given his life to serve God and the church. But one day, as Nathan shared a ride with his dad on a ski trip. He blurted out, I hate going to church. It's nothing against God. I just don't see the point. Richard Foster quietly said, sadly, many churches today are simply organized ways of keeping people from God. Surprised by his dad's response, Nathan launched into a well-rehearsed, cynical rant about the church. Okay, so since Jesus paid such great attention to the poor and disenfranchised, why isn't the church the world's epicenter for racial, social, and economic justice? I've found more grace and love in worn-out folks at the local bar than those in the pews. And instead of allowing our pastors to be real human beings with real problems, we prefer some sort of overworked rock stars. His dad smiled and said, Good question, Nate. Overworked rock stars. That's funny. You've obviously put some thought into this. Once again, Nathan was surprised that his rant didn't phase his father. He didn't blow me off or put me down, Nathan said. So, that, so from that point on, 
he actually looked forward to conversations with his father, his dad. It also proved to be a turning point in his own spiritual life. By the end of the winter, Nathan was willing to admit, somewhere amid the wind and the snow of the continental divide, I decided that if I'm not willing to be an agent of change in the church, my critique is a waste. Regardless of how it's defined, I was learning that the church was simply a collection of broken people, recklessly loved by God. Jesus said he came for the sick, not the healthy, and certainly our churches reflect that. Spurred on by his father's acceptance and honesty and by his own spiritual growth, Nathan has continued to ask honest questions but he has also started to love and work to change the church rather than just criticize it. You see, that's what grace does. That's what grace does for us, and that's what grace does for each other. When we respond graciously to those who criticize us, they are surprised and often won over. Their anger is diffused, and they learn to love and give again. That was Bill's experience. He writes, it's one of those evenings when everything goes wrong. The kids were cranky while I was making dinner, so I gave them some hot chocolate to tidy them over. Timothy, who's five, decided to throw his marshmallows at his little sister, knocking her hot chocolate all over the place. As she began screaming, the phone rang, and I foolishly answered it. And the doorbell rang, and I foolishly answered it with a phone on my ear and a screaming kid in the background. I then returned to this kitchen and hollered at Timothy and promptly had two crying kids. As dinner began to burn and I deposited my daughter in the bath, I loudly announced that I was so angry I might do anything. And so I declared I was putting myself in a timeout. I closed the door, none too gently, and tried to get dinner to be the only thing simmering in the kitchen. Everything changed about 10 minutes later when I caught sight of a yellow piece of paper sliding under the door. In the unsteady hand of a kindergartner was scrawled a message of grace that pierced my heart and turned me around. From Timothy to Dad, I still love you even when you're angry, end of quote. My friends, that's what grace is all about. Loving people even when they're angry. Try it. Try it in your relationships. Grace makes all the difference in this world. It pierces the heart and turns people around. If you're looking for God in your life, first look for his mercy, then look for his favor, and then finally, third point, when God shows up, you find fellowship. You find fellowship. See God in the face of a brother wanting to walk with you. Notice God's face in the face of a sister wanting to share her life with you. That's what Jacob saw when he had the experience of God. He saw Esau, his brother, wanting to walk with him. Look at verse 12. Then Esau said, let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care for the ewes and cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at the pace of the droves before me and that of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. Esau said, then let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that? Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that, so that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. And that's a hundred miles south. Then verse 17, Jacob, however, went to Sukkoth, 
where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkoth. That's north. Esau wants to renew the relationship with Jacob. But sadly, Jacob runs away. He has no intention of renewing his relationship with his brother Esau. He goes in the exact opposite direction and builds a house for himself and shelters for his livestock. And this is not just some tent, but it's a personal, permanent abode. A house that will stay there forever. And Jacob plans on staying in Sukkoth for a while. And he has no intention of meeting his brother in Seir. Not soon anyway, and maybe never. It's very sad, because Jacob not only misses out on an opportunity for fellowship with his brother, he misses out on an opportunity for fellowship with God himself. God had invited Jacob to go back home, but Jacob goes to another place, and it leads to a world of hurt for himself and his family, as we will see in the next chapter. His daughter is raped, his sons become murderers, and Jacob is disgraced. And those are the ramifications. Jacob experienced God in his brother, wanting to have fellowship with him, but he turned away from that relationship and suffered as a result. Dear friends, don't you do the same thing. If you're looking for the face of God in your life, if you're looking to experience God in your life, see it in the face of your brothers and sisters in Christ wanting fellowship with you. See it in the face of your fellow Christians wanting to walk with you, no matter what you're going through. Please, don't turn away from them, away like Jacob. Now, more than ever, we need this in this day and time. Even though you might not be able to meet physically, you can meet through Zoom remotely. And some of you couples, I know you're having a very hard time with your children. And it's taking a toll on your married life. Let other people into your hurts and pains and seek the help and the accountability that you need. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. My dear friends, we desperately, we, we need each other more than ever. We need other people in our life's journey. Please, don't hurt yourself by walking away from that fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Instead, in the fellowship of believers, see the face of God, experience God yourself, and enjoy fellowship with him. Keith Ferrazzi, in his new book, Who's, Who's Got Your Back?, tells the story of Jean Nittich. Jean was overweight as a child. She was overweight in high school, and despite endless diet regimens, her waistline kept expanding throughout her 20s and 30s. Jean tried diets, and then she tried pills that promised to take away the weight and the pounds, but she always gained back the weight that she lost. In 1961, at age 38, Jean started a diet sponsored by the New York City Department of Health. After 10 weeks, she was 20 pounds lighter, but starting to lose motivation, she realized that what she needed was someone to talk to for some support. Since she couldn't get her friends to make the trek with her to Manhattan to the official health department regiment, she brought the science of the program to their homes in Queens. Jean and her friends would all lose weight together. Out of those first meetings grew Weight Watchers, widely recognized as one of the most effective weight loss programs in the world. Nidich's idea was very simple. 
losing weight required a combination of dieting and peer support. She held weekly meetings with weight check-ins and goal setting to promote, to promote accountability coupled with honest, supportive conversation about the struggles, setbacks, and victories over losing weight. Eventually, Nidich, who'd lost 72 pounds, rented office space and started leading groups all across New York City. In 1963, she incorporated and by the year 2007, Weight Watchers International had retail sales of over $4 billion from licenses, franchises, membership fees, exercise programs, cookbooks, portion con control food products, and a magazine. Nidich retired in 1984, and the company's CEO, Dave Kirchhoff, said, Though the science of weight loss has evolved over the years, the core of Gene's program, support and accountability, has remained constant. It's a simple fact of life. We need each other, even though at times we still needle at each other. We get on each other's nerves. We need the support and accountability. We need the fellowship, especially on our journey with Christ. None of us can go it alone and do well. So please, don't ever walk away like Jacob did. Stay close to the fellowship of believers, and there you will experience God and what he has in store for you. If you're looking for the face of God in your life, look for it in the face of his mercy on your brother or sister. Look for it in the face of favor on your brother or sister. And look for it in the face of fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Do you have that courage and faith to move forward? You see, when I am loved, I can risk loving you. For the one who knows me best loves me the most. And as a result, I can risk loving others. I am loved, and you are loved. Will you take that chance? We are free to love each other because we are truly loved. The face of God is the face of love in each other. Please, don't miss out and don't miss seeing it in each other today. As I close with two reflection questions. Number one, who do you need to forgive and or ask for forgiveness? Who do you need to forgive and or ask, to ask for forgiveness? And number two, how are you meeting your need for fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ? How are you meeting your need for fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message this morning, which shows our need for you, our experience of you, in and through the fellowship of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We know, Lord, that that's been lacking, especially through this pandemic. But I thank you that you make it possible for us to still do that through our remote meetings and fellowship meetings and services. And I pray, Father, that we would take advantage of those opportunities. I pray, Father, that we would not walk away like Jacob did. Instead, we would see your favor. We would see your grace and mercy and we would follow through on our commitments to our brothers and sisters in Christ, and most importantly, our commitment to you. Show us, Lord, what we need to do next, especially on this Thanksgiving Day weekend, so that we might not lose out on your blessing, the blessing of fellowship. In Jesus' name we ask and pray, amen.
As far as announcements for this Thanksgiving weekend, I need to thank the hard work of our reopening committee. As I talk to other pastors and churches, they're amazed that we have a reopening committee, a reopening committee that meets every single week to ensure the safety of the people in the building and when we are ready to reopen, to have a protocol in place. So I need to acknowledge the hard work of our leaders and our professionals in our church who've taken this commitment, so praise God for that. Also, I want to thank you for your faithful giving to meet our missions pledge for November 2020, and we've gone way beyond our goal, so thank you for your faithfulness in giving towards our missions goal. As far as the announcements, 
Uh, today at 10.45 a.m., we will have our Sunday School class, which will be live via Zoom, so please join us then. Then on Thursday, we will have our weekly prayer meeting. That's also live via Zoom at 7 p.m., so please join us then. Also next Friday, December 4th, we have our men's and women's groups that will meet live via Zoom. Uh, there will be a link uh, that will be sent via email or in the uh, Google Doc in your, uh, in your bulletin. The next meeting for our young families will be Saturday, December 19th at 11 a.m. And uh, young families put that on your calendars. Also, most important, last but not least, we will have Pastor Hang Tu, our pastoral candidate, who has, who has spoken to our youth already. He will be speaking to our children's church coming up next Sunday, December 6th at 9 a.m. So parents, keep a lookout for an email link that will be sent for Pastor Hang Tu's time with the children's church. He will be leading and singing as well as sharing a relevant message for our children. You don't want to miss that. It will be from 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. on Sunday, December 6th. Please receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in you in hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.